Hello and a very warm welcome to the latest Wednesday webinar. Tonight is not actually a World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar. We are doing it in conjunction with Red, Red Wings and a whole host of other charities as part of Strangles Awareness Week. And whilst we wait for our Facebook Live audience to join us, I want to ask you two questions. One is, how many of you are taking the temperature check challenge as part of St uh, Strangles Awareness Week? And we'll put a link into it. If you haven't seen that already, please do take part. Over 200 people have taken part in the last two days. So do please get involved. And also, it'd be lovely to know where you're hearing, you're listening uh, and watching from this evening. Or um, obviously, tonight's webinar is also recorded. It's really important to say that. So when you enjoy tonight and find it really productive, which I'm sure you will, please do let, let your friends and colleagues uh, know that you'll be able to find it on the World Horse Welfare website afterwards. Um, Strangles Awareness Week is a really important in initiative. It's, it's uh, promoted and led by Red Wings Horse Sanctuary, but supported by World Horse Welfare and many other organisations. And we're delighted to do, do so because it's such a dreadful disease, but there is so much we can do to prevent it. So please do, there's lots of content coming out from Strangles Awareness Week, and we'll put a link to that in the chat as well. So please do share that content uh, as widely as possible, because there's still so much ignorance around how we can manage, prevent uh, strangles, but certainly also what to do if we're unfortunate enough to get it. We have had a fantastic evening in store. So if you are familiar with World Source Welfare Wednesday webinars, you'll know the score, but please, if you're watching on Facebook Live, put your questions in the comment fa uh, function and we'll transfer them across to Zoom. And if you're watching on Zoom, please use the Q&A function. By all means, use the chat function to chat amongst yourselves, but it's so much easier for, for us if you can put the questions in the Q&A function. And remember, in Zoom, if you see a question you like, you can upvote that question. So please do get, and we'll get through as many questions as we can this evening. As I mentioned, the webinar is going to be recorded, so you know, it'll be available to play back afterwards. And, you know, our understanding of strangles is evolving all the time. New data, new technology. So it's so important that we as responsible horse owners keep up to date with that technology, but also, and that information, but also to make sure that we are regularly speaking to our vets to, make, to, to find out how we can do all we can to prevent this disease getting on to our yards. Now, tonight is a bit of a, a Wednesday webinar with a difference, and I'm going to be handing over the reins to David Marlin, Dr. David Marlin, who is an equine scientist of global repute um, and has um, previously at the Animal Health Trust many years ago, uh, but now working independently, has written over 200 scientific papers. Um, he's contributed to the development of policy and facilities to, to meet horse welfare, and, uh, welfare standards at the top of equestrian sport in a whole variety of disciplines. And possibly most relevantly to this evening, he is president of the National Equine Welfare Council. And he also has a podcast of his own um, for, for the online equestrian community that debunks myths and promotes science-based horse management. And again, we've put a link to that podcast in the chat for you. So now it's my great pleasure to hand over to David. David, over to you. Thanks very much, Roly. Um, so, well, hello, good evening uh, to everyone. When I was asked to host this, um, I, I didn't hesitate. I said yes straight away because I have personally experienced the uh, devastating effects of strangles. This was, uh, it was while I was working at the Animal Health Trust, we were looking at uh, foal respiratory health and we had a stud that we were working with and there was a strangles outbreak which not only cost the lives of two of the foals it actually ruined uh, an almost three quarters of a million pound project so strangles can be incredibly devastating so tonight what we're trying to do is focus on some key areas of related to strangles particularly biosecurity behaviors that you can use to help protect your horses from strangles and of course not just strangles other infectious diseases and tonight we're going to be taking lessons from outbreaks that have occurred uh, at the highest level on horse sports uh, yards and on yards and event venues across the UK and what we hope to leave you with is the confidence and motivation to be able to refine or develop your management to better protect your horses and ponies 
so that you can be prepared for managing a strangles outbreak. Now, to start with tonight, what we pulled together are some key facts for you related to strangles. So uh, I'd be interested to know if you've heard of these before you're aware of these, but strangles is the UK's most commonly diagnosed infectious disease in horses and in horses globally, um, although not, of course, in Iceland, uh, where they haven't been permitted to import horses for over a thousand years. So um, that's one, one good thing for Iceland. Um, but over a third of the regions in the UK, that's 61 out of 167 regions, 37% with had cases last year. And as horse owners, we should be prepared to encounter strangles in our careers, uh, either in our own horses or in horses perhaps we're working with professionally. Now, in addition, there's some really good facts over 90% of horse owners do know the key signs of strangles, which include uh, nasal discharge, uh, snot, if we're not being technical, um, fever, elevated temperature, and of course, abscesses. And then 71% of horse owners are also aware that if strangles is left untreated, around one in 10 of the horses that recover will go on to be long-term carriers that can infect other horses for years. Uh, the stud where uh, I had the problem with my research work had had uh, strangles the previous year. So it could be six months, it could be a year, it could be two, it could even be three years later that you end up with an outbreak. Now, one of the things that may surprise you is that the World Organization for Animal Health currently does not officially recognize strangles as uh, an infectious disease, equine infectious disease, that is of international importance. Um, now, there are experts who believe it should be considered to be uh, a notifiable disease. And I would say tonight that personally, I believe that strangles is sufficiently uh, a problem, both for welfare and economically, that it should be given further consideration to being a notifiable disease. Okay, well, look, what we're going to go on to now is we're going to uh, have a poll uh, just to find a little bit more about uh, who is on the webinar tonight. So you should be able to see in front of you now uh, a poll. And the question is, which of these best describes your horse keeping? Uh, you can choose one answer. I work with horses as my main job. I educate others about horses or horse care. I keep horses for competition either affiliated or unaffiliated, and I keep horses as a hobby, uh, rarely ever compete. So a leisure or pleasure ride. And then, of course, you can say if you don't fit into any of those uh, other. So if you'd like to vote. And what we are going to be doing with uh, the, the output from this is we're going to share the results with you a little bit later on in the uh, in the webinar. Okay, now I can't actually see the uh, results, so I don't know how far into the voting we are. Um, I probably we will, hopefully most of you have had a chance to vote now. So I think we will close the poll and we're going to uh, move to a message from one of our top eventers, Piggy March. Hi everyone, I'm so sorry I can't join you all tonight, but I'm delighted to be supporting the Strangles Awareness Week and I'm very excited to be invited to join the webinar. We all love our horses and getting out and about with them, whether that's for competition or just for fun, but we have a duty to care for them too and to each other. Raising awareness of the threat of infectious disease and working to improve our biosecurity are just some of the ways we can protect our horses and our community. Strangles has been so misunderstood for so long. People used to think of it as something that we could just run through a herd. But in fact, a strangles outbreak can be absolutely devastating for a yard or an equestrian business causing very nasty complications in some horses, or in worst cases, they can even lose their lives. 
So what we would try to do to protect our yard, our horses, our business from any infectious diseases are uh, just be as sensible as we can do with our horses when we're out and about. We certainly don't, you know, take them up, share lorries, share stables, share tack, let your horse go and, you know, sniff someone else's horse when you're having a chat to them or anything like that. We're pretty conscious when we get to events. You know, my team, my traveling girl Ames is very on to just taking their temperatures when they arrive. So we always make sure, you know, our horses are, are healthy themselves. Um, we take great care even at home on the yard of when other horses come here for lessons or might stay over that they're kept well away from our own yard. Um, and they either just stay on their, their own horse box and use the um, arena and all their own equipment or they stable in one of our isolated stables which are always thoroughly cleaned out afterwards. So we take um, as much care and attention to that side. It's very important and shouldn't be overlooked. So get involved, get taking your horse's temperatures, upload them onto the online checker on the Red Wing Strang Strangles Hub and you could be in with your chance to win. Okay, so we've offered a prize of a yard tour to the winner of the Temp Check Challenge. So good luck all taking part of that and I look forward to meeting you. Whoever you may be, come and have a walk around my lovely yard here at Madewell and come and meet some of the old stars and the younger hopefuls as well. Look forward to meeting you then. Well, that's fantastic, P. Thank you very much for supporting the campaign. Um, and as you see there, you've got the opportunity to get a yard visit. But we've also, there was another one you may have seen, Richard and Joe Davidson um, are also offering a behind the scenes tour um, and the chance to meet them um, for, to anyone who takes the Temp Check Challenge this week. OK, so now we're going to have a look before we move on uh, at the uh, the poll results and those should be up there now. So which best of these best describes your horse keeping? Uh, I work with horses as my main job, 22 percent. Uh, I should have started with the top one, shouldn't I? <laughs> I keep horses as a hobby, rarely or ever compete. That's the, the majority, 41 percent. Uh, I work with horses as my main job, 22 percent. I educate others, 15%. That's great. You can take away from tonight and uh, and disseminate and, and to others. Um, other, 13%. And then I keep horses for competition, affiliated or unaffiliated, 9%. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that. That's a useful insight uh, for us. Right. Um, so... Now it's time to invite our first speaker, and that is uh, Katerina Termine, MRCVS. And Katerina is the Senior Equine Veterinary Advisor to the FEI. And uh, Katerina is going to speak to us uh, on, the, on the subject of taking the heat out of competition and why the heat of competition should not be in the competitors. And she's going to talk to us about how infectious disease outbreaks at the highest level of horse sport are being controlled more strongly in recent years. Katrina, welcome. Thanks very much, David. Um, let's share my slides. I hope you can see that. OK, thanks very much. Well, first of all, I'll say a few words about what we actually do at the FEI, because I appreciate that um, there may be people listening today who are not familiar with what we do. So we are the international governing body of equestrian sport, and we regulate the sports of um, jumping, dressage, eventing, driving, endurance and vaulting. And we have 136 national federations who are member bodies of the FEI. Um, we have 120,000 horses and athletes that are registered with us. And during the course of a year, we have up to 4,300 events. So as you can imagine, um, that involves a lot of horses coming together and meeting. And of course, play security is a great part of the work that we do. Now, our events have indeed been affected by infectious diseases. Um, back in 2012, um, you'll see here we had three cases of flu 
um, that was actually in vaccinated horses. So I think that reminds us that we still have to put our biosecurity measures in place, even when we're dealing with a vaccinated population. Um, we have um, we've seen a lot of problems actually with equine herpes virus. We had um, a couple of cases, single cases in Lillistrom and in Prague back in 2019. And that led us to um, improve our biosecurity rules a little bit. And we did that. But in 2021, as many of you may have seen in the equestrian press, we had a huge outbreak in Valencia. Um, this was really, this was really, really tough. It was devastating. We had 118 cases just on the venue. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. Um, however, that led us to making much wider changes to the rules um, concerning biosecurity. And in the past um, few months, this is back in March, we had um, two events in Belgium that we saw where we saw one case each of equine herpes. And then we had a small outbreak in Oliva. So in order um, in, in order um, for us to make sure that the horses um, that are coming into the stables um, are free from, as far as we, we can determine, free from infectious diseases, um, we, of course, check the temperature. Um, we, ensure that, we ensure the temperature has been checked twice a day for the three days before they arrive. And this is done by the grooms um, or by the athlete. And they have to record this in the FEI horse app. They also have to fill in um, an equine health self-certification form as well. And that's to declare that the horses come from a stables where there are no cases of infectious diseases um, and there's no horse undergoing um, any tests for infectious disease. Um, next, um, the vet at the event um, examines the horse to make sure there's no clinical signs of infection and um, the horse's temperature is taken. And again, that's recorded in the app. Um, the horse's um, flu vaccination record is also checked. And if the horse is in compliance with all these things, that's when it can be allowed to enter the FEI stables. Now, of course, we put a lot of effort into making sure that we're admitting um, horses without any clinical signs of infection into the FEI stables. So, of course, we have to make sure that we continue to make we continue that and we make sure that the horses are in a clean environment and that they stay healthy. Um, so uh, a lot of a lot of the general measures um, that you may implement in your yards, and um, we've actually adopted these as rules um, for our events. So first of all, all the stables have to be cleaned and disinfected before the horses arrive and between uses of the horse. And um, all events will have an isolation um, isolation stables. Um, that's absolutely necessary. Um, we, min we want to minimize the close contacts of horses. So again, it's really important to um, keep, a, keep a space, keep a distance between horses. And again, that's something, you know, we can do every day when we take our horses to shows or we go to places where horses meet and gather. Um, another important thing is that we ask everybody to sanitize or wash their hands or change their gloves in between handling horses, because of course that's another route of, route of transmission. Um, and when it comes to equipment, um, if, for example, the top right-hand photo here shows um, an equine ambulance. So if that's used, um, it has to be cleaned and disinfected between horses. And equipment, that's another thing. Um, we, really, we really encourage each horse to have its own set of equipment to make sure it's clearly labelled. Um, and if it is shared, again, that has to be cleaned and disinfected between horses. Now, something that um, we made a lot of changes to following the Valencia um, EHV outbreak um, is when it comes to temperature taking. And this has been an absolute game changer for us. Um, the horse's temperature is also taken for the entire time that it's on the event venue. And it has to be done twice a day. And again, it's recorded in the FEI horse app. So if a horse um, develops um, a temperature above 38.5, that's our cutoff. Um, um, it, this is the first sign that there may be something wrong with a horse. We do have to consider um, that temp there might be temperature fluctuations after exercise. Um, it could happen after transportation. That you may see a raised temperature if it's a warm day and you've been stuck in traffic. Um, circumstances beyond our control um, but also 
this is also an indicator of non-infectious and of course infectious diseases so we really really have to make sure um, that we are um, keeping a track of this and being aware of what may be going on so if your horse has a fever um, the first thing we do is that the horse has to be isolated and this is absolutely critical in terms of stopping any potential transmission to the other horses at the event. Um, secondly, the horse has to be rested. And I think this is something that's rather overlooked in a way. Um, I think it's really important for equine welfare. If we think of ourselves, if we have a fever, we're feeling pretty bad. You know, we don't want to go to work. Um, we don't really want to do anything. We want to sit on the sofa and have a duvet day. And we have to consider that our horses, and they're not going to perform, they're not going to be feeling so well if they have a fever. And so rest is the most important thing we can do for them. Next, um, we have to examine, test and treat the horse, of course. So first of all, we have to determine what, what the problem is. Why does the horse have a fever? Is it, is it an infectious disease or is it something else? And it's important that we keep these horses comfortable as well. Um, and if we can make these diagnoses early and um, make sure that we treat the horses early in the disease and process, this is the best thing that we can do for getting the best outcome for the horse. We, of course, have to think about being contacts as well. We have to identify them. We've got to monitor them carefully. And we also have to make sure that they don't have any contact with any other horses because we don't really know what's going on at the moment. There may be other horses that could be harboring disease and we don't want the transmission to continue any further. So it's really important um, that we take early actions, um, not only for the disease transmission, uh, stopping disease transmission, but also um, for looking after our horses to our best ability. Now, as I said earlier, um, temperature temperature taking um, has has been absolutely fundamental um, to the changes that we've made and it's been a game changer for us and it's actually saved lives. Um, I've brought some statistics here for you, just a few figures on the um, on what happened at Valencia and um, what we saw in Oliva um, earlier this year and the difference is just really stark. So um, in Valencia we had 752 horses on site um, and we had 118 cases and that's actually on the venue. Um, we very sadly had 18 deaths that were connected um, to this outbreak and because of the extent of the transmission um, we ended up having to test and trace nearly 4,000 horses. It was a truly enormous job. So if we compare what happened to Valencia to what happened um, in Oliva earlier this year, bear in mind we have stricter um, temperature taking controls in place. In Oliva, we had more horses. We had just over a thousand horses, but we only had 28 cases and we had no deaths. And the only horses that we, that we traced, we tested, um, were the horses that had been on the venue. So in both instances, uh, we did manage to cancel, we, we did cancel competition. Uh, we thought that was the right thing to do. Um, but actually, when we consider the impact that this has um, on a wider scale, um, when it came to a Valencia, we ended up having to cancel all the European FEI events for six weeks. And this was because um, we didn't want to we didn't want disease being transmitted any further. So that was a measure we took. And of course, that had a huge impact. And by acting earlier um, in Oliva, uh, we were able um, to continue with all the rest of our events as planned. So as I said, it's been a huge game changer in terms of being able to act a lot quicker and save horses' lives. Now, I think we have to remember that it's not just taking the horse's temperature at the event and that's important. We have to do this after the event as well. Um, and that's because when horses meet, that's the point in which they may become, may pick something up, they may become infected. And so we're not going to see any change in temperature for some time afterwards. So this is going to happen when, when we're at home. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little example of how helpful and what kind of an insight and regular temperature taking can be. So here we are. Now, I'll have to admit, this is my own pony, and this is what we were doing during Easter. We were very busy with, the temp with temperature checking. 
So as you can see, um, we've established a normal for her. She's fairly consistent at 37 in the mornings and just 37.3 um, in the evenings. However, on Monday and Tuesday, we heard a lot of coughing. And with that coughing, we saw a little wobble in her temperature. You know, it, it raised and it went up just to the top end of normal. And the reason for this coughing actually was because as many podies, they're very greedy and uh, they find their way into places that they shouldn't. Um, and she got some hay that wasn't soaked. She, of course, had an inflammatory reaction. And this is consistent with this little wobble in temperature here. So she stops coughing. Um, it's all resolved. And then um, you will see that on Thursday, Wednesday evening, the temperature is coming down. Thursday, we're back to around 37 again. Now, um, in the afternoon, um, sorry, in the evening, um, her temperature started to raise. And then on Friday, we actually had a fever and she was quiet and she was lying down. So as I, as I explained earlier, she was actually the only pony on the yard at the time anyway. So she was isolated, but we rested her. We canceled our plans to ride. Um, I examined her. We treated her to make her feel a little bit more comfortable and she got lots and lots of TLC. But we have to think about why this is happening, what's going on. If we'd perhaps been to a show the, um, during the weekend before, I'd be thinking this could really be something going on. There could be an infectious disease here. She might have picked something up. But actually, in reality, I vaccinated her um, in the afternoon and she just had a little reaction to that. But it told us a lot about what was going on. Um, it was really interesting to see this and very helpful. It's like the it's like another piece of the jigsaw when we're looking after our horses. So on Saturday, you'll see she was back to normal and she had the zoomies around the field. So as we can see, um, temperature taking can help us in so many different ways. Um, it's great for monitoring our horses on a day to day basis. It's great for spotting any abnormalities um, in temperature, these little temperature spikes or a fever. Um, that might happen and this can guide us into acting early and um, first of all it will lead us to isolating the horses so it stops disease transmission it's resting the horses and making sure that they get early treatment and diagnosis so we get the the best outcome for them as we saw um, in the in the oliva and the valencia outbreaks um, taking temperatures can help to save horses lives um, it's not only going to benefit your horse but also the health of the other horses on the yard as well. Um, so my advice really is take a, I, I would recommend that you um, take the horse's temperature as a part of your horse's daily routine. We want to give these horses a good life and do the best for them. If we think about what we do with our horses on a daily basis, we brush them, we pick out their feet at, twice a day. And my advice to you is keep your thermometer inside of your grooming kit and not in the first aid kit and pick it up as frequently as you would your hoof pick. So thanks very much, everyone. I hope that gave you an insight as to what we do. And I'm really happy to take any questions. Thank you, Katerina. That was fantastic. At this stage, we're not going to take any questions, um, <laughs> but potentially later. Um, so. We're now going to move on to our uh, panel discussion. Um, now, what we want to do is bring the, the focus uh, to outbreak management of strangles uh, specifically. And we have a panel of vets and horse owners with recent strangles experience. So at this stage, please drop your questions in the Q&A. Don't put them in the chat box because we won't see them uh, and we won't be able to answer them. And Remember, you can use upvote to see the questions that you most uh, would like to have answered. OK, um, so it's time to introduce our uh, panel. We have, first of all, is Helen Wilkie, who is a vet based in Ayrshire, Scotland. Uh, she has experience of working with multiple unrelated strangles outbreaks in the past year. Uh, and this has included a case in a Shetland pony whose treatment lasted for almost a year. Um, she's also working on a current outbreak. Uh, so thanks very much, Helen, for taking time off and welcome. Um, our next panelist is Abigail Turnbull. Uh, Abigail is an event venue and livery yard manager based in Yorkshire. 
and she runs uh, an award-winning and busy event venue. In 2019, they discovered a positive case of strangles uh, two weeks before a long-awaited uh, major British event in event with 850 horses and riders coming to compete, uh, which subsequently had to be cancelled. Since then, Abigail has been uh, a very active advocate for better biosecurity amongst horse owners and equine professionals in her region. Uh, good evening, Abigail. Um, and, hello. Uh, so then we've also got Katie Kelly, who is also a vet, and Katie's based at Oakham Vets in the Midlands, uh, not that far from me, and has been one of the vet team involved in treating the horses affected in a large strangles outbreak in that region this year. Uh, and last, definitely not least, we have uh, Fiona Maynard. Uh, Fiona is a visually impaired Team GB para rider, uh, and we are really grateful to Fiona because she agreed to step in at the last minute due to uh, another panellist not being available. And Fiona has just experienced a, a strangles outbreak, which is coming to an end. Um, so... First of all, I'm going to uh, start with you, Fiona, if you're ready. Um, and what helped your yard get through your outbreak? Um, we've got, sorry, hang on a sec, we've got a tech issue. Somebody can unmute Fiona. I think I might have done it. Don't worry. Oh, you, yes. Uh, no. Yes, we can hear you, Fiona. Even though it says you, no, you've gone. You've gone again. <laughs> Sorry, I've got the ability to mute her, but not to unmute her. I need to ask to unmute. Okay, Fiona, can you unmute, please? Have you, we, no, we haven't quite got you yet. Looks like your tech support you had earlier is gone. <laughs> David, if you move on to the next question, then I'll yeah. message Fiona. Okay. Um, tell you what, we'll, we'll, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, Abigail, are you there? Yeah, I'm there, <laughs> I think. Right. Um, yes. What helped you throughout your outbreak? I mean, it's obviously devastating, uh, a, a competition of that size having to be cancelled. What helped yeah. you get through the outbreak? Um, actually, when we Googled, about what to do the first one of the first things that came up was how red wings dealt with it and we literally copied their traffic light system of um the red amber green and segregated each yard to one red where we knew we had strangles one amber we were testing and one that we thought they seemed to be okay um and we just locked down everything just i guess like foot and mouth when, we, when foot and mouth was about we're farmers uh, originally so we just um completely locked down and we were so strict but um at the time we had about 30 40 i think 40 horses on the yard um one was down with it and it spread to five others um but we i mean we were fearful that they were all going to get it um so we'd never dealt with anything like that before um because that that was going to be sort of my next question to you you know so how prepared or unprepared were you for this outbreak? Uh, very unprepared, I think. Um, it was such a shock because we'd um, only bought the equestrian centre in the summer of 2018 and we'd spent the, the last year before we got the strangles basically cleaning, tidying, demolishing, rebuilding. It was immaculate and um, you, you know, I'd heard of strangles um but when we found out we actually we couldn't believe it we couldn't could not believe that we had it it was just and the horse that came down with it had been on box rest um for several months so we just thought it's it you know they've made a mistake it's not strong we were just in just couldn't believe it so, and what, what would you say to sort of other event venues or, or professional yards where they've got horses coming and going um, who haven't experienced an outbreak yet it's um I mean we don't know how we got it we still to this day don't know how um biosecurity is a massive thing now um even on the yards with um the owners if if they've disappeared and been to a venue somewhere 
um, with the horse and then come back, you know, making sure the washing hands, a bit like the COVID situation. Um, that's how we, it was quite topical because after we had the strangles, then it wasn't long until we got, everybody had the COVID. So we, we said to people, it was like when we had strangles, it's like, although it was like the bacterial element, um, as opposed to the virus, it, yeah, just really good biosecurity and the horse's temperature is the first sign. We, ha I had charts in the kitchen of every single horse on the yard and I made every owner um, on the yard text me the horse's temperature every morning and every night. And we could just, that would, I mean, we did do blood tests as well. Um, but that was just in it, the first indicator. Right. And uh, as we've seen, you know, you're giving the same message as, as Katerina. Um, you know, if you can pick up a temperature, you have a chance to move a horse yeah. away and yeah. stop things spreading. Um, and and it, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it can pick up anything. It'll pick anything up. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a two minute job. If that, you know, you spend forever, you'll pick your horse's feet out, you'll brush them, everything. Just take the temperature as well. Just get into a routine of doing it. And and how supportive did you find um, everyone was? Um, the majority were fantastic. We were very open about it. There was a minority of um, people that told us that we'd done it all wrong. We shouldn't have told anybody. We should have kept the horse trials. Um, yeah, it, I was quite shocked. And the... the the people that were telling me this or, and telling my husband this were people that we ha had in quite high regard in the horse world, which was really quite shocking. Um, yeah, I, think, yeah, I think it's it's unfortunate. I think that view is changing. There's less and less yeah. people, but yeah. there are still people yeah. who believe you should keep it quiet, which, of course... Mm you know, is definitely not the thing to no. do. I mean, if, you know, it's not even worth thinking about. We had 850 horses come into the horse trials. Um, yeah. Wide area. Yeah, huge area. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, and it could all be traced back to you. Yeah. For that venue. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Abigail. Um, right, Fiona, we'll come back to you. Um, so your outbreak you're coming just to the end of your outbreak now aren't you when did it start um it started uh, at the beginning of april and um, we were unfortunate enough to have a horse that was actually a carrier come in uh, for some training and that's how the outbreak occurred okay and what's a, what impact did strangles have on on your yard um and your horses your own horses um, it's had a huge impact on our yard. Um, for a start off, it's a huge work to suddenly kick in biosecurity. We've had to fill in all the drills in between the horses' stables. We've put up loads of temporary fencing, um, just getting all the foot dips, hand washing, getting totally organised was a huge, you know, infrastructure and financial, um, just even on the first day. Um, and then, unfortunately, I've not been able to compete next week. I was supposed to be at an FEI event um, with my top horse. And obviously, I'm not able to attend. Um, and, yeah, it's both financially and emotionally, um, you know, very stressful. But uh, have you, you've had, obviously, a lot of uh, veterinary support. Your vets have been excellent. Yes. Have all your horses come through and they're now... Um, healthy and, and recovered yes yeah we were very fortunate only to have a couple come down with it um unfortunately two of them uh, are still having ongoing treatment as when we came to do the guttural pouch wash which is kind of my real point i want to get across we thought they had a normal temperature and they had no discharge no discharge anymore and yet when they put the scope in my vet said fiona we've got a problem these horses need further treatment otherwise they will become carriers as well um so we were very unlucky that both the horses to come down with it have then yeah are still having treatment mm, that, that is unfortunate um can i ask you being visually impaired how did what what specific difficulties did you find dealing with the outbreak 
Um, for a start, as a practical thing, I can't read a thermometer. We've now managed to find a um, dodgy talking thermometer <laughs> on yeah. the internet with a Japanese accent, but that's taken a bit of time to... Are you um, having to learn Japanese to understand the reading? <laughs> um, so that's been quite difficult. And obviously I work mainly on touch, um, which obviously is the one thing we're trying to avoid right now. So I've actually only been really looking after um, my top horse and one other horse, which we've kept in very, very top isolation um, to try and protect him um, and my yard manager and the rest of the team have been amazing looking after the rest of the horses we also had designated people um, for small groups of horses because then they could monitor any slight change and I thought that would also help with the biosecurity and and going forward do you think you're going to change I think I know the answer but you <laughs> Are you going to change uh, how you do some things on the yard? Yes, definitely. I think, you know, I mean, our our team are very good. At, as soon as we think something's off colour, uh, we temperature check. That's how we picked up the cases actually before we knew that the carrier was a carrier. We had one mare that was looking off colour. My old managed to check the temperature. She had a temperature. So we isolated her. We didn't at that point know it was strangles. OK, well, look, thank you ever so much. Please stay with us because we going, we'll have some questions from uh, the audience in a bit. Now I'm going to move on uh, to Katie, who's one of our vets. Katie, hello. Are you there? Hello. Hello. So uh, can I ask you, from your perspective as a vet managing strangles in yards, what helps a yard get through an outbreak, do you think? I think in the cases that I've been involved with, um, them identifying cases early um, was key in them getting through it quicker um, because ultimately less horses end up getting infected um, because they implemented you know, strict biosecurity, put horses into isolation and quarantine quicker. Um, they identified those um, signs earlier. Um, I also think communication and being you know, very transparent um, also helped, you know, letting owners and riders know um, that there was a problem. Um, so it just stopped them spreading it, you know, reduced movement and uh, implement those biosecurity measures um, a lot quicker. Um, I think in the cases I've been involved with, we've been quite prompt in um, obviously identifying them, but implementing the sort of traffic light system that we've already sort of mentioned. Um, in, previous panellists, um, so the red ones being those infected horses, the amber ones being sort of in contact, and the greens being the ones that haven't had any contact, but yeah, trying to isolate everybody and group them so you can sort of manage them all sort of separately. Um, I think, as I said, biosecurity is absolutely key um, in trying to limit the number of horses to get infected. And obviously, from a financial point of view as well, trying to get them through it quicker try and get back up and runner. Thank you. And do you feel that horse owners' uh, attitudes towards strangles are changing? Uh, do you think people are becoming more aware and how serious uh, an infectious disease it is? I think in the, man, like the cases that I've been involved with, I think, you know, people have been very wary of it. You know, the new temperature could mean that and we're on you know on the ball quite quickly and um, which is always a good sign um, I think as you sort of been highlighted before some people have that um, opinion of maybe brush it under the carpet a little bit which is obviously the wrong way of um, approaching it but I think the vast majority of people are very aware of it and quite receptive to it. And do, do you find at the moment with there being quite a high profile on strangles that you're getting more owners coming to you saying what can I do to protect myself against uh, or reduce the risk of getting strangles? Yes definitely um, I've seen a massive um, increase in people just bringing the hospital for you know advice um, as to what they could do um, and also discussing vaccination um, as well vaccination protocols for strangles 
um, it's been a very hot topic, for sure. And Fiona uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, she had two carriers um, out, you know, this one, we talk about generally one in 10, but of course you can be unlucky, um, even if you've only got two or three horses, they all end up being carriers. Have you ex experienced multiple carriers in, in single outbreaks? I haven't myself, to be honest, but yeah, it's, it's the sort of the luck, isn't it? Um, of it. Um, I haven't, but yes, with some of the outbreaks I've been involved with, you know, it's been quite hard to pinpoint where it actually came from. Was it, you know, the movement on and off the yard, but also is it a carrier that's been in that yard? Um, so it's a bit of a puzzle trying to work out where it actually came from. And as, you know, it's been previously highlighted and by one of the other panellists, sometimes you don't know where it's come from. But um, no, luckily I haven't had too many multiple carriers. Fine. Let's hope. Have fingers crossed. Okay. Well, look, thanks very much. Uh, stay with us because, as I say, we've got some questions. Um, I'm going to move now to Helen, who's uh, based up in Ayrshire. Um, hi, Helen. Hi. Um, in terms of, um, you know, what Katie's uh, experience, how does that compare to you in a different part of the country? In terms of carriers, like finding, just or just in terms of attitudes to strangles, uh, yeah, I think the um, the cases I've been involved in, the yeah owners had a very good sort of attitude um, and made it very open. Most well, yeah, most of the yards I've worked with have actually got a Facebook post and sort of told the area around them that that they do have strangles and um, you know they've stopped deliveries, going out to competitions. Um, so yeah, no, I've yeah, generally you know, um, sort of good response and one that's probably helped stop it spread sort of in the area further. And I mean, what what are your top tips for owners either in terms of picking up outbreaks or what to do when they they have a, a definitive outbreak? Mm -hmm. I think the first ones if you've gotten a new horse coming to the yard or you. Know, you know, going out and, and mixing, um, isolate those those new horses, um, or if they're mixing, you know, check those your horses' temperature when it comes back, um, and make sure when you're isolating that you're doing it, you know, properly that the you're not letting sort of direct contact between horses. You're also not sharing equipment. You're seeing that horse last, and you're not then you know going and sitting in the tap room or. Um, you know, speaking to other people or helping other people, their horses afterwards, that you go home, you get changed, um, and that's going to pick up. We should do it for at least three weeks, so it'll pick up other infectious diseases as well. And um, obviously, strangles um, will be picked up that way. So, and in terms of um, if you've got no known strangles cases in an area, um, what's your approach in? in sort of uh, weighing up the, the likelihood that a horse you've gone to see uh, is, is likely to be a strangles case? I'm generally quite wary with, um, you know, if I see a, go and see a horse and it's got any of the clinical signs, sometimes they'll have really mild clinical signs. Um, when we get called out, it might just be a very mild cough um, or, you know, a small amount of um, nasal discharge, which could be down to other reasons. Um, they may have a temperature, a temperature may have, you know, happened a few days before, no one picked up on it, and now it's gone. Um, you know, it really depends on the case. If, you know, if it's one horse and they've been there for 10 years and they live by themselves, the chance of strangles is fairly low. But if it's on a yard, then you know, we will test it. Um, and I do tend to, I tend to actually print off the Red Wings fire security protocol sheet. I give that to the owner. I say, just follow this until we get test results or we have a better idea of what's going on. And, you know, better to, preemptively do too too much and then do too little um, and just isolate it until you know proven otherwise okay brilliant thank you um so we're going to uh, go to some of the questions uh that have come in some of these will be for the uh for fiona and abigail and some will obviously be more appropriate for helen uh and katie um Let's see, where shall we start? I think this is one for you, Abigail, probably. Um, possibly, possibly for you as well. Uh, this is from Abby McLennan. Uh, Abby says, for livery yards, how can we get everyone everyone 
on board with upping their daily biosecurity routine without uh, to reduce the risk of experiencing an outbreak? We have it in our livery contract um, now. Well, it was in anywhere, but it's it's in the livery contract. Um, we also have a WhatsApp group with every single livery client in. And if they're seen to be doing anything untoward, um, there's a ping on their reminder. Um, all our livery clients have to have taken out the Stamp Out Strangles pledge, um, as have all our farriers, vets, physios, nutritionalists that come onto the yard. Um, and it's just another reminder. We've got posters and things up. Um, so it's just, it's... It's all about educating, really. And if they understand why, then they're more inclined to do it. Okay. Um, right. And I think so. We've got quite a lot of uh, vet questions. Um, let's, Katie or Helen, uh, how long should pasture be rested after infected horses have been in it? Do we know the answer to that? Six weeks. Yeah, six weeks. <laughs> okay. So in wet conditions, it can last up to six weeks. Um, yeah. So yeah, give it six weeks. Um, and then, Katie, uh, can you tell us about the new Strangles vaccine? That seems to be a popular question. Yeah, DECRA have um, Strangvac um, out. It's a, um, an intramuscular vaccine. Um, you give the first dose and then you give them another dose in four weeks. Um, they can get some adverse reactions to it, which is something to be um, just mindful of, usually quite mild, um, but can be a bit of a fever, maybe a bit of a vaccine type reaction to a bit of a lump, um, or maybe a bit of ocular discharge. Um, you know, usually mild, things, but um, it can happen. Um, there's sort of advice not vaccinating in the face of an outbreak. Um, so vaccinating it, you know, sort of a um, more of a prevention than in the face of any disease. Okay, thank you. Um, one for you, Fiona. Uh, this is from Rebecca Boulay. Uh, does the pressure of competition mean that the stigma around strangles is even more prevalent? Yes, I definitely think um, that. Um, yeah, I've noticed a lot of people have been like, oh my goodness, you know, are you going to, when are you going to compete again? And that sort of thing. And it is, I think that's, you know, I feel quite nervous even when we've got the all clear about going out and how people might react to me being out. Um, my vets have been brilliant and said, actually, we're probably going to be one of the safest people because we're going to be so more biosecure aware than a lot of people out there. But yeah, I think the stigma surrounding it and competition horses, which I think is why a lot of people and yards do brush it under the carpet, whereas I felt um, quite strongly, because obviously our outbreak was because of the carrier, um, that I wanted to raise awareness um, about, you know, the guttural pouch pledges and things like that, because I think that's so important for us to get on top of this disease. Great, and, and the more this gets discussed, you know, hopefully the more and more attitudes will, will change over time. Um, Helen, for you, uh, any further advice about cleaning up once horses have the all clear? This is from Linka. Do I just work on everything? Um, well, hopefully by the time we've got the all clear, you know, you've been doing quite a lot of disinfecting and they've had sort of three or four weeks where they've not been showing signs and hopefully not been transmitting the bacteria. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you keep going good um, disinfection protocol, and then by the time you've got the all clear, hopefully the environment will also be clean. Um, normally I do advise keeping horses stable during the outbreak so they're not out in the field and contaminating the field. And um, it does last longer in sort of damp conditions. Okay. Um, so uh, this is probably one for you, Katie. Uh, from Lucy Emsley, would a vaccine like the COVID jab help to support horses if they got strangles so i guess what she's asking is if a horse is good, has the strangled vaccine but then still contracts strangles is it likely to be less ill 
yeah that's the yeah that's the general idea is hopefully um if you've given the vaccine they'll have mounted a bit of an immune response as i said with any vaccine they could still have the risk of getting it but yes hopefully the clinical signs would be milder but it doesn't necessarily protect them as such you know they don't necessarily they could still get it just hopefully milder okay thank you um abigail one for you i think uh this is from kate jackson Thank you for sharing your experience, Abigail. As a fellow livery yard owner, I'm interested to know what your isolation procedure for new horses is now. Um, so now no horse will come on the yard unless it's had a negative blood sample uh, test done. Um, we found that a lot of blood tests come back in the grey area or quite high. Um, so a guttural pouch procedure um, seems to be the quicker way to get people on the yard um and that's like your gold stamp that there's nothing there and then they spend uh two weeks in isolation in a they can still ride the horses but we request that they um don't go near any other horses in the arenas they have the um a paddock which is um an isolated paddock so the horses can still go out and everything um, but yeah, two weeks, and then the, we ask them to take the temperature every morning and every night, and um, then they're on the yard. And then a similar sort of question to you, Fiona. Because, so you have people coming in for lessons who then go, is that right? And then you also have horses in that stay. How yeah. will your management of those change after your experience with the recent outbreak? Um, we've sort of been looking at, ways of um, maybe introducing the blood test rule as well for horses that are staying um, and we have got two isolation boxes um, which I think for horses that are coming in um, for like we have visiting trainers come in for clinics and things that those horses will have to be separate from the rest of the yard and the same sort of the procedures that we do for the FBI shows I'd like people to take their temperatures before they come um, and whilst they're there Okay, thank you. Um, and what actually, just maybe to follow on from that, how do you think you will do anything different now when you go to, or you ask your team when you go to competitions? Do you think you'll change anything? Um, I think we are going to have, we've already got terrible OCD. Um, we've actually had to put hot water in up the yard um, because all our hands were getting so sore from the constant <laughs> hand washing in cold water. Um, so yeah, I think biosecurity, you know, at the shows, we're going to be even more, you know, please don't go and talk to anyone else's horses or, you know, I feel so nervous now about it, um, you know, but I think, you know, good biosecurity keeps everyone safe. And and that, you know, that OCT nervousness is just testament to how devastating Strangles is for so many people. Um, and, and it's, it, again, it's so good that we're having this sort of discussion so that the message can be got out that it's not just something that's inconvenient. It is a serious disease, both health-wise and financially. Um, and emotionally, I would say, probably as well. Um, right, for, one for you, I think, Helen. How long uh, does a horse remain infectious after the symptoms have stopped? Um, so coming up sort of three to six weeks, normally it's not quite as long as that, but we're not sure, or we can't be sure which horse, you know, is going to um, be infectious for longer than others. So normally advised to start... Um, Scoping them in an outbreak, sort of, yeah, three to four weeks after the the last horse has finished showing signs symptoms. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Um, this is a comment, which is uh, is one that's worth reading out. This is from Barbara Mills, who says she's watching from Nottinghamshire. She said we had strangles several years ago with high biosecurity and immediate action. We stopped it spreading through forty horses. We had only seven that uh, became infected but they went really quickly from just being mild to seriously ill so um you know that that's testimony to the fact that if you do have a plan 
and you do act quickly, you can reduce uh, the, the impact. Um, so this is actually one from uh, from Red Wings, from uh, Nick Debra. Hi, Nick. Um, this is one for you, Abigail. Uh, does Abigail feel that her biosecurity steps are now an accepted habit for all on her yard to follow? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's all it needs. That's it's pretty just good. now it's common practice now when it's... Um, it's funny I'm listening to Fiona I completely relate to how you're feeling and everything and it does get better because <laughs> you become so kind of worried about everything but it does it now it's just second nature um so yeah okay we've got uh one probably for you Katie um this is um I can't I don't think that's somebody's name um I think it's <laughs> uh it, it's not it's not their name but pony on yard has strangles two years ago and now has a new strangles infection she's the only one showing symptoms and is isolated how can she have it again um it, it, there's quite limited um knowledge of how long the immunity lasts so after um having having strangles previously um, you know they can't get it again um, their immunity, we just don't have it really in literature of exactly how long their immunity lasts. So that can happen. We can definitely get it again. Okay. Thank you. And a couple more um, from uh, all on the same theme, really. So Helen and Katie, uh, very quickly. Uh, talking about persistent absences, some people say their vets are reluctant to give antibiotics. Um, what would be the, the, the clinical reasons why uh, you might not want to just keep hitting this with antibiotics? Okay. So antibiotic, I, I tend not try not to treat with antibiotics. Um, antibiotics can sort of suppress the infection, stop the immune response um, from developing, which then can leave them open to so contracting strangles again, possibly even in that same, same outbreak. Um, there is also a possible link with further complications. Um, so ideally, if, you, yeah, if your horse is coping, it's better to um, keep going with supportive care. And um, you can give anti-inflammatories to help them make them feel better, increase their appetite, take down temperature, um, and then avoid antibiotics unless there are other Sort of complications that then require them but I think that's a you know discussion to have horse um sort of individually based on each horse and with your vet at the time yeah absolutely I, I'm guessing Katie you're nodding so I, I'm guessing you you would agree with that it's... yeah I would agree I usually um hot pack them up abscesses and encourage them to burst um rather than one antibiotics unless they need to be good Okay, so the message there really is if you don't understand, go back to your vet and say, uh, you know, why why is it that you are not using antibiotics? And they will explain to you, I'm sure. Okay, we're, we're now just going to wrap this up. So I'm going to go to each of you uh, and ask very quickly, just in uh, one minute, um, whether you can each give your uh, uh, top tips for a horse owner, for whether they've had strangles or not. Um, or anyone who may be affected by an outbreak at this time. So, uh, Fiona, would you like to start? What would be your quick top tips? Top tip, uh, keep your in contact with your vets, keep smiling, and please, 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 Dutch or Pouch, wash your horses at the end of an outbreak. Brilliant. Thank you. And Abigail? Um take your horse's temperature and get into a routine of doing it because it'll just pick up anything, whether it's strangles or not. Um, and take out the stamp out strangles pledge with red wings. <laughs> very educational. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And then Katie. I think being very strict with biosecurity um, and just trying to um, reduce the risk of it happening and reduce the spread if it does happen. And I agree, take a temperature is key. So you pick up not only strangles, but other um, infections, diseases, a lot quicker. Okay, and then Helen, finally. 
Um, I think act early if you see sort of any signs, um, any change of temperature, any cough, snot, um, isolate those horses and then seek help, speak to your vet and get sort of a plan put in place. Excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, you've covered so much so quickly and I'm sure that there's something for everyone. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of consistency in the messaging that, that you're all giving. So thank you very much for joining us and giving your time. Um, we have to draw this to an end at this point, uh, the panel discussion. Any of the questions that aren't answered tonight that you've put, because there were a lot of questions, um, including questions for Katerina, will be answered on the Red Wings website and shared via the Strangles Awareness Week social media channel. So keep an eye on those. And in the digital delegates bag, which is posted in the chat, you'll find useful information about practical outbreak management and strangles as a disease. So we're now going to move on uh, with another short film uh, because awareness of what is going on in your area is a key part of strangles management and what sort of measures you're going to take. So we've now got a short film that's going to show you how you can find out where strangles is being diagnosed in the UK and to help you keep informed and on top and to make sure that everyone involved with your horses is up to speed and practicing good biosecurity. And of course, one of the things that that uh, helps us with is, for example, if you're using that tool and you can see there are a lot of cases in your area, then you, if you don't practice biosecurity, that is the, the key to, to start practicing it um, or to even up your biosecurity. And you may even want to make decisions on where you travel to compete based on where outbreaks are. OK. So we're now going to move on uh, to a presentation from Professor Ashley Boyle from the University of Pennsylvania, because uh, so far we've, uh, everyone presenting has been very much uh, UK based, um, but of course strangles is a global disease. And although access to tests and vaccinations varies globally, we're talking about the same disease. And much of the evidence base that we have on Strangled is being generated through uh, a dedicated group, the international team, it's an international team of veterinary scientists. Um, so I'm really delighted that we've able to have Professor Ashley Boyle from UPenn uh, tonight with us to give a quick summary of the advancement in understanding of the disease that have been gleaned from this group of researchers. And some of the key questions developments being worked on and so perhaps some insight into what we can expect in the future in order to help us try and manage strangles or reduce the risk of strangles. Um, so Ashley is a co-author of the International Consensus Statement on Strangles, um, and she now is joining us from the US. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. I'll share my screen.
So you can you see my screen now? We can. Uh, you're not in full screen view. That's it. We got it. In and out. Okay. So um, not only do I do research on strangles, but I also am a field veterinarian and take the students out to the field um, here at University of Pennsylvania. So um, I take it, I, I come from both a clinician and scientist standpoint. Um, what I wanted to point out is that the Dorothy Russell Havemeyer Foundation has been really key in our collaborations with the Global Task Force on Strangles. Um, this was this foundation was founded in 1979 to improve the health and welfare of horses. The um, with a key focus on the prevention of infectious disease in horses. The foundation sponsors workshops throughout the year on multiple um, diseases and um, of horses with about 25 to 30 scientists and veterinarians that attend. And what we do is you actually have to present to attend the, the, um, the meeting. The first Strangles workshop was in 2006. And actually the next one is in a couple of weeks here in Pennsylvania um, in the US um, and with 40 delegates coming from across the world. So Strangles is first described by Georgianus Rufus in um, 1251. Um, Streptococcus equi, the bacteria that causes Strangles was first identified in 1888, and the, the genome for, for the bacteria was completed in 2009. In 1664, Solicell said, strangles is a disease which young horses must pass through in the same way as children's, children must pass through smallpox. And Napoleon agreed in 1811, he requested that his horses be enrolled and sh um, should it that they should have already um, had strangles before they joined the, his army. But obviously it's not something that we actually really want our horses to pass through as has been mentioned multiple times already tonight about the fact that it actually can cause serious disease and um, in a low number of horses, even death. So we actually are trying to, to prevent strangles from happening through all these biosecurity measures. Modern strangles or modern strains of strangles date back to World War I. So um, in using genomics, the, we've been able to um, determine that similar strains are still circulating from, from that time. And it's thought that because of there was a um, massive global movement of horses, uh, on an unprecedented scale um, with about 5,000 horses imported to the UK from the US each week. And this resulted in an emergence of the fittest strain of strep Streptococcus equi. Um, and there was an estimated 8 million horses killed in World War I um, related to strangles. And this resulted in new initiatives such as the establishment of the National Stud in 1915 to replace the killed cavalry, cavalry horses. And as it was just mentioned in the, or shown in the video, there's strangle surveillance that um, is being done in the UK um, with 335 diagnoses of strangles in the UK in 2022. And this is actually probably an under um, estimate, uh, underestimation of how many horses actually have come down with it because it's actually done off of laboratory testing. So if Sometimes some horses are tested and then you know that the, another horse has it and because it's going through through the barn or through the yard. And so there's probably actually more horses that are actually coming down with it than this number. And this came from 119 veterinary practices that have submitted positive samples with 63 regions of the UK affected. Um, and 37% of positive horses were from sport horses. And I think this is a great example of, um, and as shown in the previous video about um, knowing where strangles is and, 
um, we actually have a similar thing in the UK, in the US um, through the Equine Disease Center, um, but it is all on a um, volunteer basis. Um, so I, again, I think it gets underestimated on how many cases are, are um, presented in the US. So we're trying to improve that. So in, in 2018, we did the Strangles Consensus Statement. Um, this document can actually be um, freely obtained um, through the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine website. Um, and it we put together guidelines for treatment, control, and prevention of strangles. Um, some of the things that um, are recent um, recently shown by um, Professor John Timoney was that strep equi, the, the bacteria that causes strangles, it infects the lymph nodes within hours of exposure. Um, we know that the incubation period can range from three to 14 days, um, but that, as previously mentioned, the onset of fever precedes the shedding in majority of cases. So that's where that biosecurity really becomes key. And as the examples have been shown of, of outbreaks being able to minimize how many horses actually come down with it, if you move them, as soon as that fever is identified, then um, you're going to have better luck. So this is the, the um, color coding that was mentioned earlier. If you actually keep your, uh, if you have a horse that um, you think has strangles and has a fever, trying to separate horses that are um, not affected and not thought to be exposed, um, which can actually be very challenging sometimes to, to determine. And sometimes you actually may not determine any horses in the green category. They may all be in the yellow category of horses that are um, recently um, uh, exposed um, or uh, um, to the infected animal. So when you check the temperature and you notice that there is an increased temperature, then you actually want to move that animal into the isolated area um, and Keep the, and then have all the horses that are in the isolated area um, separated and let them go through the course of the disease. And hopefully that will keep it from spreading throughout the barn. We've worked on um, the role of carriers as um, there have been new global collaborations to, to better understand the persistence of strangles. Um, and the development of improved guidelines for screening horses arriving from other premises. Um, in that study, looking at the surveillance of strangles in 2022, 43% um, of the diagnoses actually came from the guttural pouch. And so if you're actually unfamiliar with what the guttural pouch is, it's an outpouching um, of the the nasal passage that is a blind-ended sac um, as outlined in this, this diagram here. And then you can see that it's in close proximity to the retropharyngeal lymph nodes that are just below the guttural pouch. And what can happen is that the guttural pouch can actually, um, the retropharyngeal lymph nodes can rupture into the guttural pouch. So um, uh, horses can actually get infected, get infection within that guttural pouch and you can see it on endoscopy. So this is a video of a horse that is recovering from strangles and actually it's found to have a lot of, for lack of a better word, pus in the guttural pouch. Um, some of these can actually be what are called chondroids where it's dried pus that um, become basically rocks of pus and it can actually um, as Fiona mentioned, can take a, a lot of time to um, treat these animals and lavage, lavaging them out. Here, we're using a, um, a basically an instrument through the endoscope to try to pull the, the pus out of the guttural pouch. Um, and this can take multiple treatments, multiple days to, to do. Um, but a lot of times these horses need help to get this out 
um, because otherwise it will stay in the guttural pouch and that's how those carriers um, can stick around for years on end. So strangles is caused by Streptococcus equi, which it continues to spread from country to country as horses travel. And we've actually been able to track the strains as they move around the world. So we've shown that it actually, that there has been spread from one country to another. Um, so it's not just from one barn or one yard to another yard within a country, but it, it can actually also be um, from horses moving in competition throughout the world. Um, but it, so basically it can affect any animal. Um, We've also been working on the importance of the quarantine procedures, um, the development of improved diagnostic tests, and the development and, and launch of new vaccines, as was mentioned earlier. Um, some of those vaccines are, there's some vaccines that are available in the US and some that are available in different, in, in in Europe and the UK, um, and hopefully we'll um, start to see more um, kind of cross um, protection with vaccines being available in different countries and with some of these new newer vaccines. And so this is just to kind of talk about how there's like 19 countries and many, many institutions that are working on trying to, to get rid of strangles and work on the, the research associated with strangles. Um, so we're working on it all over the world and, and we'll be all together in a couple of weeks here in Pennsylvania. So thank you. You're on mute, David. My apologies. Uh, I was saying, Ashley, thank you. It's uh, fantastic to see such a great international effort. Um, and it, I think the number of institutes and scientists involved illustrates how we should be, uh, how everyone should be approaching strangles, not just as an inconvenience, but as a, a serious disease um, with, with serious implications for, for welfare and economically as well um well that is nearly me um i i really didn't have any hesitation in uh taking up this um offer to host um and i think having listened to what's been presented tonight uh and people's experience i'm, I'm even more uh glad that i took this up just to conclude i think uh things i'd like to say is uh, to forget as many of you as possible, please, please, please to take part in the temp check challenge. Um, get to know your horse's temperature and make it part of your routine. It's going to be something that doesn't just help you uh, keep your horse healthy as far as strangles, um, other illnesses and infections as well. Um, I hope that more people as a result of this uh, webinar tonight will begin to use temperature checking as part of their normal routine um, uh, and consider it when you're moving your horses around or new horses are coming onto your yards. And we hope this will get easier um, as technology improves. There are already chips with uh, microchips which have uh, temperature sensing in them. And in fact, uh, I did uh, I did the PhD examination for a student from Australia who's done probably the most of the work in this area, evaluating the accuracy and of those chips. Um, but in the meantime, simple, cheap thermometers do the job. Um, so just my final thing really is to say thank you to our presenters, uh, Katarina and Ashley, uh, for giving up their time, and also to our panelists, uh, Helen, Katie, Abigail, and Fiona. Uh, and finally, Rowley, thank you for letting me loose on air. David, it was an absolute pleasure and what a brilliant job you did. And, and just to reiterate, thanks to, to both our presenters and the whole panel. What, what, a, what a wonderful sort of, um, just over an hour, it's been a really practical advice. And I love that, 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 I can't remember who said it, but keep smiling because it is, it's a tough, it, it can be very tough when you get strangles and very frightening. Um, so I really hope that today's webinar has given everyone some real um, encouragement 
uh, of, of how to, to, to tackle this disease and how, how to prevent it. And as you say, David, it's, it's all about good biosecurity and temperature checking. So uh, it is, and the reason it, it's so important to take temperature regularly is to know what normal is. But if your horse does get ill, then you'll be able to get treatment to them as quickly as possible. You'll be able to minimize the, the spread and it'll also reduce the cost of the spread because as we know, disease can be a very costly business. So it really it does mean that taking that simple action of taking temperatures can be so important. That's why um, David's already mentioned it, but the temperature check challenge is, is um, available. And so please do get involved. We had, as I mentioned at the beginning, over 200 over the last two days. Let's, let's get those numbers really up into the thousands. It'd be brilliant. And we've put that in the, in the chat box. But we also recognize not everyone has a thermometer. So there is an opportunity. I'm afraid we can only ship them to UK addresses. Uh, and, and in saying that, it's brilliant to see such a, a, a global audience. We have people from Saudi Arabia, from France and Sweden, from Netherlands, Poland, Austria, and the USA, and of course, across the UK. So brilliant that, that you, you, you've joined us. But if you're in the UK, and you would like to have a, to, to get a free thermometer, then we've put up a, um, a link in the chat box there. And the voucher code, keep a straight face when I say this, is HOT BEFORE SNOT. Uh, that's a capital H and a capital B and a capital S, but HOT BEFORE SNOT. If you put that in uh, as your voucher code, you will get uh, the proud owner of a shiny new thermometer. As David mentioned, unanswered questions are gonna be um, addressed on the Red Wings website. Uh, and also will be posted to the Strangles Awareness Week channel. So please do look out for those. As I mentioned at the beginning, you can really help us now by getting the message out there by sharing the posts uh, from Strangles Awareness Week. And you can also, if you're interested, become a campaign ambassador. Remember, tonight's or today's webinar is going to be available on the World Horse Welfare YouTube channel. So please do uh, spread that link so people can be aware of tonight's um, webinar and all the brilliant information that David, our panelists and our, um, our presenters have given to us. And uh, thank you again to all of our panelists and we look for, uh, and presenters and to David. And we look forward to seeing you back in November for World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinars when they're back into action. But in the meantime, have a lovely summer if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Take care. Bye bye.